This is a historic moment because we want our fellow citizens to know that there is a cloud of witnesses that say that those innocent persons, especially the precious babies who are killed by U.S. drones in Pakistan, in Somalia, in Yemen, have exactly the same value as those priceless white children who were killed in Newtown, Connecticut, as those black brothers and sisters in the South Side of Chicago, brown brothers and sisters in Mario, red brothers and sisters on the reservations, yellow brothers and sisters. We are here to bear witness and to say that we will not allow the kind of callousness toward catastrophe and indifference to criminality to become the norm and routine in America. of Dorothy Day. We remember the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. We remember the legacy of Philip Barrett, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Hesh, Grace Balls. These are names that constitute figures in movements that said it's time to straighten your back up. It's time for us to try to awake our fellow citizens. No more sleepwalking in America when it comes to militarism, when it comes to consumer market-driven materialism, when it comes to racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Arab hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, homophobia, any form of xenophobia, but most importantly, when it comes to imperial crimes. Yeah. I want to begin with an epigraph from the great W.B. Du Bois. You all know the great Du Bois. Yeah. Oh, that towering intellectual, that great freedom fighter. He was 89 years old. He began with a trilogy, three novels. Six years after, he had been handcuffed in a courtroom. 1951, February 51. Why was he handcuffed? Because he was willing to stand up and say, America, you have become not just a full-fledged empire, but you're turning your back on so many of the precious wretched of the earth, to use the language of Francis Fanon. Well, in 1957, on page 275 of his novel, The Ordeal of Mansart, he raised four questions that we will be wrestling with today and tomorrow. The first, how does integrity face oppression? Yeah. <clears throat> Not talking about ideology and politics yet, we're talking about integrity. What kind of human being do you want to be? What kind of nation do we want to be? What kind of species are we in process of shaping? The second question, what does honesty do in the face of deception? There's a whole lot of mendacity going on, a lot of lying in high places, a lot of wickedness taking place in terms of these immoral and unjust policies. Third question, what does decency do in the face of insult? Integrity, honesty, decency. And that fourth question, how does virtue meet brute force. Doesn't get any more significant than that. Doesn't get any more profound than that. What kind of integrity, honesty, decency, sense of virtue do we want as persons in our own brief trek from mama's womb to tomb? This is a personal question, an individual decision. But then we decide to come together, to coalesce, to organize, to mobilize and say in the name of our quest, our fallible quest for integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue, we want to tell the truth and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak in every corner of the globe. Oh yeah. And also be quite explicit that this is a love movement. We love our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. Yes. We love our brothers and sisters in Yemen. We love our brothers and sisters in Somalia. We love our brothers and sisters both in the West Bank and Tel Aviv. We love our brothers and sisters in Ethiopia and Guatemala too. That's not just rhetoric. It means you got to do something. You got to be on the move, on the ground, because justice is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. Yeah. And 
we are honest with ourselves, we have to acknowledge that the dominant tendencies of our neoliberal capitalist society is pushing us toward an authoritarian, soft, fascist regime. Yeah. Let's just be honest about it. First tendency, financializing, the financialization of our economy. There's a connection between the military, military industrial complex and the oligarchic complex of Wall Street. Yeah. And the prison industrial complex affecting so many of our precious poor black and brown brothers. And the cultural multiplex that connects Hollywood and cable news. <laughs> so we get such a truncated, narrow political discourse that we have to choose between a far-right, mean-spirited, cold-hearted Republican Party and a milk-toast, spineless <laughs> people and this is not a matter of political correctness this is a matter of choosing to be a certain kind of human being willing to organize and mobilize with others who are making that choice to at least keep alive some beacon of hope in a world of such bleakness for so many of our precious brothers and sisters around the world that financializing 43% of profits now go to big banks. Yeah. They produce no products, just deals. Right. The big money in private pockets. And then the privatizing, that second tendency. Any public space, public education, privatize it. Make profit. Public prisons, privatize it. Our public conversation is so weak, so feeble, it's been so privatized, polarized, no civility left, very little sense of entering public space without humiliation in order to try to get a sense of what the realities actually are. So we end up with escalating levels of not just mendacity, but ignorance. I didn't say stupidity, because all of us have forms of ignorance. <laughs> Taught in Ivy League for many years, and I've seen various species of learned ignorance. <laughs> Not all of them, they all have their limitations. But when you connect the financializing of the economy and the privatizing of our society with the militarizing domestic front and on the international front, the schools in hoods militarized. Yeah militarized, going through security to precious young ones as they dodge bullets, dealing with massive unemployment, disgraceful housing, decrepit education. And then they get there and there's no arts programs That's right. to pique their imaginations. The rich kids get taught, the poor kids get tested. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. Yeah. Industrial complex subsidizing a Wall Street with 85 trillion dollars a month going to banks with nearly zero interest rates. Wouldn't it be nice for our students to have the same interest rates as yeah. banks? into understanding our neoliberal capitalist economy, which is global. That's why it's so good to have our brothers and sisters from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, and other places. Why? Because in the end, we're talking about an international wave of moral awakening, of political escalation that puts a stress on public interest that highlights the weak and vulnerable, be they children, elderly, workers, peoples of color, gay brothers, lesbian sisters, all those persecuted, maybe religious persecution. But behind Iran, it could be ideological persecution. What's going on in Russia? Pussy riot, sisters. And of course, the great 
William Lloyd Garrison's of our day, the Edward Snowdens. complex 
What is AFRICOM? Why is the terrorism sh shifting to Africa now? Why are the drones shifting to Africa now? Let's tell the story of Lockheed. Let's tell the story of how, in fact, public space is so contracting and emptying out and becoming evacuated that for the only option for some of us is more and more hit the streets and go to jail. Yeah. Yeah. Can't be known. We want our fellow citizens to know that if they straighten their backs up, if they begin to raise their voices, not just echo the mainstream, but most importantly, put in the language of Ralph Waldo Emerson, and they have the courage to become originals rather than just copies that imitate the mainstream discourse, we might be able to turn this nation around. And in turning this nation around, is connecting with others in other parts of the world that target that connection to the neoliberal capitalism, the increasing wealth inequality, paralyzed political process and government. Drop drones on innocent people, and especially innocent children, and think somehow that that doesn't affect your soul, your destiny, your sense of who you are as a people, let alone who you are as a fragile experiment in democracy given that imperial weight and burden that's snuffing out the energies of so much of the democratic practices in our society. So I mean, when I think of the, the National Lawyers Guild, mm -hmm. Brother Ratner and the others who were with us at the Manning Travel, Chris Davis and the others, I mean, they've been masterful in trying to ensure that our legal, our, our legal system is just to the degree to which we're willing to fight, right. sacrifice, and keep it just. And it's still far, far from being fully just. But concessions have been made by the powers that be to poor and working people. That's part of what movements do. Mm -hmm. That's why I invoke those names as signifiers of movement. They have made concessions so that rights and liberties are very precious. <clears throat> very precious indeed. And we have to continue to fight at, 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 on, in that liberal terrain, on that liberal terrain, in that liberal zone. Because that can dry up, and we're really on the, on the road fashion. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, legal reform is not enough. Amen. It's just not enough. We're gonna be much more fundamental transformation. <laughs> Women have made breakthroughs, our gay brothers, lesbian sisters, bisexuals, and transgender folk making progress. That's very important. But progress for what? To be included in the neoliberal capitalist regime <laughs> with the same kind of right. challenges that everybody else has. So it was a relative failure. We've had some relative victories, too. That's very important to keep in mind. Now we, should, we should keep in mind this as well, that June 27, 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. makes a phone call to Malcolm X. Very few people talk about this. Malcolm X was going to the UN to put the United States on trial for the violation of human rights, beginning with black folk lynching and so on. And of course, as he continued to, 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 to mature, he was connecting poor people the way Martin was, and even talking about working people, and always focused on the precious dignity of people in Africa. They wanted to get together to put the United States on trial for the violation of human rights like the violation of the human rights of those brothers and sisters that we talked about killed by U.S. drones. And what that does is it sparks a dialogue. And people say, well, they were signing their death warrants when they did that. That's the sense in which that's true. Because some of us have to be willing to die. Not everybody, because somebody got to be around to keep fighting. <laughs> but what they were doing was saying, you know what, we're going for broke. And they never got a chance to do that. Yeah. And you see, in 1964, with Detroit to come, with Watts to come, with Newark to come, with D.C. to come, lo and behold, that kind of momentum channeled in the right moral and spiritual way. We're not talking about rage tied to revenge. No. We're talking about righteous <laughs> indignation tied to justice. When that takes place, then you've got some serious pressure. The elites in place shake in their boots. 
They shake in their boot. And one of their aims to keep us divided. That's right. Keep us separated. Mm -hmm. Keep us so far removed from one another that when they see us coming together, they know that a new day is at least a possibility. And that's precisely what we were trying to do at Stop and Frisk. We've seen now there's been a setback in Stop and Frisk in New York. We've got a new mayor. He's progressive. We're going to see whether he's progressive or just another neoliberal who uses progressive language but governs in a neoliberal way. I like his spirit. We're going to see. See, as a Christian, I like to put loving, tough pressure <laughs> on all the politicians. I don't care what color they are. We must ensure that black people have a sense of self-respect, they have self-defense and self-determination. And as he became even more internationalist, concerned issues of class, conservative issues of empire, and more and more would have been concerned issues of gender, and his own organization, he ensured that women had major positions in that time. That he would be here with us saying, as a revolutionary Muslim, as someone who's concerned about those on, on the chocolate side of town, I'm un 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 unapologetic in terms of my love for black people, but my love for working and poor people is intense too. And that we need to be able to come together recognizing that we do not want unanimity, we want unity in diversity. Yeah. There's going to be a variety of different voices, perspectives we want our anarchistic brothers and sisters, we want our socialist brothers and sisters, we want our progressive brothers and sisters, we want our self-styled latitudinarian brothers and sisters, whatever you bring. We want prophetic Jews, we want prophetic Catholics, we want prophetic Baptists. We want prophetic Morgans as of Mormons, that's not a contradiction. We want all the folk who are concerned about integrity, decency, honesty, and a sense of virtue. But Malcolm was very clear about from which where he's coming from. And I think his voice in some ways is becoming <coughs> as important as the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. because Martin Luther King Jr. was sounding more and more like Malcolm with a Christian twist when he was shot dead. And when he was shot dead, 72% of Americans disapproved of him and 55% of black people disapproved of him because he was moving in a radical direction. And we need to catch up with him and Malcolm and so many of the others. Yeah.